unless you're in mechanically inclined and not even mechanically inclined, I think it would be uh, mechanically curious. Um, let's go ahead and uh, give it a feel the shove. Howdy and welcome back to the Addicted Motors YouTube channel. Uh, my name is Troy and in this video we're going to talk about, uh, I guess, an update on my 08 supercharged L322 Range Rover. Now, for some reason, my probably most mundane, boring vehicle, because it's completely stock, unmodified, 160,000 miles, uh, is also one of the more popular asked about videos on the channel. Um, just because for some reason it seems to tick a lot of boxes for a lot of people and myself I've done a series on it. you can check it out in my other videos uh, I bought it sight unseen at auction for very cheap and have been Experiencing some of the woes and some of the upsides of ownership So feel free to check out that series. I think I have four or five videos on when I bought it what I fixed um, and some tick some uh, tips and tricks on how to keep things running but again, if you look around me, all these, I think, more interesting vehicles, including the 911, which no one cares about. Uh, people do care about the LR3 because there's lots of broken LR3s. But let's just go up and uh, do a little drive in the uh, L322. All right, so here's how she sits today. I think I bought this in about May of last year. So this really isn't a six month ownership. It's just a general ownership update. Um, and I think, again, I, I paid like $4,200 or something for it which is outrageously cheap, but I, it was on the pretense. I'm assuming the previous owner traded into a BMW dealer because the transmission was shifting funny. I brought it back. I changed the filter, the fluid, and it's working much better now. It's not 100% perfect. It does have 162,000 miles on it, but it's not bad. And I don't really wash it that much. I don't, you know, I don't baby it. This is, uh, I guess I would consider it a daily driver in conjunction or in, uh, in, in addition to the supercharged Jag, which is weird because I'm dailying two supercharged British vehicles. So that's a whole nother thing. But again, I took a huge risk and I have a lot of people ask me about, you know, why that risk kind of paid off, Be paid off for a few reasons. Uh, and that's one of them is because it had a lot of things already done to it that I didn't have to do. It had new brakes and rotors. The tires are from 2019. They have very few miles on them. They're not all terrains or anything, but they ride nice. They're, they're cheaper Goodyears. Uh, new brakes on the back. Uh, and recent service, just had the oil change and a few other things. So I didn't have to do anything right off the bat. Also the control arms at the time, I think were good. So that was like save myself another $1,500 in control arms. And the air, air suspension works. So it didn't have any major flaws. So let's jump into the interior. It has the uh, the rubber factory max, white interior, not my favorite, not what I, not what I would have opted for, but you know, uh, it's fine, it's fine. I would, have, I would have preferred a black interior. You know, there's ways to go about uh, potentially changing that out, but everything functions on, on the inside, except for the heated seats, which actually I find incredibly annoying. The cooled seats work, the heateds don't. It, had, it throws a code for some recirculating something. Um, but that's fine. Even the backup camera didn't work. It's got a loose coax cable. It works sometimes. Even that I'm not too concerned about. So I'll do a little cold start here. No real lights on the dash. I get a check spare tire pressure, which I don't do. That goes away. I also get a check coolant level because the sensor is probably malfunctioning. It's not low on coolant. Coolant's actually been perfect, so is the oil the whole time. All right, so what else? Let me take off here. L322 ownership. Um, so other other major ticket items that I've done, uh, the, the front air shocks, I replaced those. I tried to do it myself, had some seized bolts, head out of the shop, melt those off. Um, but if those bolts, if those original, the original hardware on those original 160,000 mile air shocks hadn't been seized. Um, I would have been a, you know, an hour job in my driveway, which is really ideal for things like that. And again, I, I, a lot of people, uh, despise having to deal with air suspension issues. I get it in comparison to a coil sprung car, but those air, oh, there's air springs, air shocks, however you want to classify them lasted 160,000 miles, which is downright impressive. And is more probably than most uh, 
you know, normally sprung coilovers or, or whatnot in a similarly equipped vehicle would last. All right, the things, um, things that I'm planning on doing, I probably should do the rear, the rear shocks. Um, just because, I mean, the front ones, after looking at them when they were off, they, they were visibly had some cracking due to age. Uh, the rears aren't as bad, but it's probably just a good thing to go ahead and replace it. Um, another thing is I probably want to do the oil and probably both the front belts. Now remember this and the 4.4 Jag engines have two belts uh, on the motor, which again is kind of annoying. It makes it a little more intrusive than doing a normal uh, single serpentine belt change. Um, other updates, fuel mileage, uh, it ranges between 15 city and uh, let's call it 18 to 20 highway, depending on how fast I'm going. Uh, again, not great, but it's got a large tank. It will, will achieve over 400 miles to a tank. So again, makes it uh, very dailyable. But what makes it even more dailyable and more interesting to drive is the power and sitting around 400 horsepower it's, uh, I don't hate it. Let's go ahead and uh, give it a, feel the shove. Yeah, no, that, that never really gets old. Um, it is hilarious power. It's not, it's not like a Cayenne turbo. It's not really comparable because it doesn't handle at all. Um, there, this doesn't have any dynamic dampening or anything like that, at least the 08 model that I have. I think you could get some options in the Sport for some dynamic dampeners in uh, the L320 and probably in the 5 liters, so other the supercharged model that came after this one. But this, pretty standard, a lot of power, it's a hoot, um, you know, so it just makes it that much more livable. But let's get into why I'm making this video. Now, again, all, all those things aside, I've been getting a lot of questions, and actually I was, I was talking to a, a viewer at uh, Cars and Coffee this weekend who saw the car and was asking me about it, as well as a few other people who hit, hit me up on Instagram or uh, Facebook. Uh, remember, you can follow and ask questions. I'm pretty accessible. I don't know everything, but I've got enough experience making bad mistakes that I could provide a little bit of in, insight um, about purchasing one of these. And I... I most people don't like my answers because like some of the videos I've made, I, unless you're in mechanically inclined and not even mechanically inclined, I think it would be uh, mechanically curious. Um, and that's what, it, you have to fit that bill to live with something like this. Uh, because for all the minutes and hours that it, it drives in a carefree fashion um, and you can enjoy whatever, whatever adjective you want to place to the driving experience, um, you also have to realize that you will potentially have issues that aren't financially feasible to get repaired or diagnosed at a shop. And I think that's what it comes down to. It's not that the repairs or the things that go wrong are hard to fix. It's understanding what it is, communicating it properly, acquiring the tools and the materials needed to do it, and then executing on it. I mean, there's a lot of shops that really won't touch these. They won't work on them, um, and just because it's not because of they're hard to work on, it's just because of the, the it's a pain in the ass, right? You bring it in for an air suspension fault and then something else happens or they find something else and then the customer's upset about that issue and they think the issues are connected. It could be. You gotta remember, these things are almost 20 years old. This one, a little bit less, but still the design, the components, everything is old. This is an old car and I think that's a tough, uh, a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow. But that being said, if you can get one real cheap or you can find one that has been maintained meticulously, which even if it was been maintained meticulously, you're still gonna find things, there's still gonna be problems. This was the dealer maintained, had the book thrown at it, and there were still issues and things that needed sorting. Um, things that the previous owner just lived with, I'm assuming. So you really have to take that in mind. And, and, and I hate to say it, but no matter what, how you buy one of these cars, there's gonna be lots of repairs and maintenance and it might not all be super expensive and it might be a lot of things you can do yourself but it's going to need to be done let's uh let's waste another dollar and a half of fuel right here Whee! but i don't hate doing that 
but again, I want to put it in two categories. Don't buy one from a dealer, a, pay, a buy here, pay here a lot. That's absolutely the worst idea because again, they're probably not mechanics. They bought it from an auction. They did not diagnose anything. And if it aesthetically looks pleasing, then you know it'll be marked up as, as full retail and you'll inevitably have hidden issues and undisclosed things that will completely bite you. Uh, the next scenario, again, private sale one owner and there's something about a one owner car you can't replace it it's like a low mileage car i'm not saying every one owner is great but you know if you if your parents ever bought a car new most of the time they never had to replace an engine or a full suspension or anything one owner cars just tend to receive normal wear and tear normal maintenance and they're okay it's the transition of north between multiple owners that really causes the issues from let's call it 90 to 200,000 miles when most enthusiasts end up purchasing these. And the, the last category, the second of the two categories on how to buy it is again, don't buy someone else's project, but if you're knowledgeable enough to diag what someone was not able to figure out, um, then you know that's that's the second one to get it cheap and put some money in it because if you buy it expensive one you're still gonna have to put money into it so you might as well get it cheap and you might as well have the all issues all the issues known um so you can budget for it and i think that's important budgeting for the truck don't make this your one and only car that's a terrible idea uh make this your second car your third car your project car and in the, and always have something else you can drive i'm not pooing or poo-pooing on land rovers in general but again this isn't a brand new one. This is an old one. And now I'm gonna be stuck at the train. Up, oh, man, I, that's that's lucky. It's amazing. It's a Norfolk, Norfolk Southern train. It didn't fall off the tracks this time. So yeah, that was just a quick Sunday. Addicted Motors. Let's call it a fireside chat on bad decisions. You know that same logic applies to uh, an LR3 or an L320 Sport or whatnot. Um, again, they're they're all fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it your, your sole vehicle. Um, again, just for those, just for those reasons, there are things I can keep it down for a while, but again, when it's running and things are functioning, it's incredibly enjoyable. It's incredibly interesting to drive. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. It's just, it's a slightly elevated experience, um, and allows you to tinker with it at the same time. I took great satisfaction in being able, able to fix things myself. Uh, not everything. There's some things I don't want to do at all, which is why I've got a shop to uh, to fix the things that I can't mess with. But it's the nickel and dime things that keep these trucks alive, uh, not so much the major service items. Uh, it's the nickel and diming that will make owners kind of give up and, uh, and toss one of these away. So that's probably going to be it for this video. Thank you for watching. It's a beautiful day in Richmond. Um, in the wonderful south side on Riverside Drive. Check out that view, not too bad. And uh, yeah, I hope you liked the video. Please check out the rest of the series on this truck. This is uh, not, this isn't a wrap up video, but now if you see this video and you're new to the channel, go back and check out the uh, the journey this, this truck's been on um, and some of the fixes and some of the modifications that I've done to it. And as always, please like, subscribe, do all that fun YouTube stuff, and hopefully we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you so much for watching.